Big news, fossil fans, big news. Walking with Dinosaurs is back on PBS with stunning new visuals that bring the ancient world to life like never before. Head to the link in the description to learn more. In the late Triassic period, around 230 million years ago, in what's now Poland, an early dinosaur ancestor scampering across the landscape suddenly stopped in its tracks and, wait for it, heaved up its lunch. A glob of plant fragments, fish scales, and beetle exoskeletons hit the ground with a splat. But that's just the start of this puddle's journey through deep time. See, while body fossils take center stage in museum exhibits and pop culture, animals leave behind more than just bones. Because after all, each animal only has one skeleton to submit into the fossil record, and even that only has a tiny chance of actually fossilizing. But over a lifetime, they'll leave behind thousands of individual excretions, like feces and vomit, which, when they're fossilized, are known as coprolites and regurgitolites, respectively. Or poop and puke. And in their own way, these could be just as interesting and informative as body fossils, telling researchers an enormous amount about the animal that left them. Not just their diet, but also their body size, their place in the food web, and how numerous they were, giving us a richer understanding of their ecological context. When other more conventional lines of evidence fail, or when the picture they paint is just incomplete, fossilized digestive products, that's a polite term for it, can still fill in big gaps in the story. And the mystery of how dinosaurs went from small ecological side characters to the icons of natural history they became is exactly one of those times. While their bones from this pivotal chapter are few and far between, the other clues they left behind can reveal how this epic saga played out to those with a stomach to decipher them. Because it turns out, the story of the rise of the dinosaurs is a tale written in puke and poop. You're probably not gonna to wanna to eat while watching this episode. The late Triassic period, around 230 million years ago, was a chaotic time. Life on land had radiated into a staggering amount of diversity following the end Permian mass extinction 22 million years earlier, with multiple groups competing to fill in newly opened niches. Apex predator Rallosuchens stomped across the landscape, croc-like phytosaurs terrorized the water's edge, and lumbering herbivores like aetosaurs and dicynodont mammal relatives munched their way through the forests. In the shadows of the giants, the earliest dinosaur relatives were small, opportunistic omnivores, representing just one obscure reptile group in a rich and competitive world. But over the 30 million years that followed, as the late Triassic transitioned to the early Jurassic, dinosaurs almost totally eclipsed all that competition establishing one of the most impressive evolutionary dynasties that life on land ever saw. And while we know that this did happen, the conventional fossil record doesn't capture this period of dinosaur success in enough detail to tell us how it all went down. But in 2024, scientists working in the Polish Basin region of Europe published a study that painted a fresh picture of this pivotal transition, albeit with not-so-fresh paint. Because key to their new study was a collection of over 500 fossilized digestive products spanning 30 million years during the final chapter of the Triassic, when dinosaurs exploded onto the scene. This collection included over 100 kilograms of fossil poop alone, plus fossil puke and fossilized intestinal contents, enough data to reconstruct the complex food webs of both dinosaurs and their competition during that crucial window. Now, fossil poop and puke have been used before to study deep time, usually to infer the presence of a species or provide info about their diet. But using hundreds of individual samples from a single site, tracing across tens of millions of years during a massive evolutionary transition, that was completely new and exciting. For many of the fossils, the researchers could identify the species most likely to have made them. They did this by associating them with nearby bones and tracks and by analyzing their size and shape, also known as their gross morphology, as the paper puts it. And like, hit the nail right on the head, yes. The scientists then performed a series of much more complex and sometimes pretty high-tech analyses on the specimens to reveal their inner secrets. Like chemical treatments to release tiny plant fragments from the samples, allowing researchers to tell what kinds of vegetation were being consumed and how much. And more than 100 specimens were even sent to a particle accelerator for synchrotron scanning, where they were blasted with high-energy x-rays. This allowed the scientists to peer beneath the surface of the fossils and build high-resolution 3D models of them without having to break them open. Fragments of others were coated with platinum or gold, making them conductive enough for a technique called scanning electron microscopy, where a focused beam of electrons was used to image their surface in exquisite detail. So in plain English, what I'm describing is literally gold-plated poop. 
After squeezing all the data they could out of the specimens, if you will, and combining it with body fossils, trackways, and environmental data, the researchers began to see a story come together. One that unfolded in five phases, with an unmistakable ecological turning point around halfway through. At first, in the late Triassic, around 230 million years ago, the ancestors of the first true dinosaurs, like the one we mentioned earlier, played just a small background role in the overall environment. Their coprolites and regurgitolites contain fragments of insects, beetles in particular, as well as fish and plants, too. But in stage two, by around 220 million years ago, their first carnivorous dinosaurs emerged, a little higher up on the food chain. Fragments of bones appear in their poop and puke, showing that they had slightly expanded their niche. These included the oldest true theropod dinosaurs, the group that would eventually give rise to the big predators like the tyrannosaurs, carnosaurs, and spinosaurs. At this stage, though, these early carnivores were still small, slender, and far from the top of the food chain. Then, the theropod dinosaurs began diversifying into more, and often larger, predatory species. And by stage three, about 210 million years ago, dinosaurs as a whole no longer occupied just the ecological margins. But the highest levels of the food chain were still ruled by non-dinosaurs, like this huge predator with the most metal name ever, Smok, whose coprolites and regurgitolites are riddled with the crunched and bite-marked bones of its large prey. And alongside the increasingly diverse predatory theropods in stage three, plant-filled coprolites from their first herbivorous dinosaurs appear too. These were likely early Ornithischians, a group from which many famous dinosaurs would eventually evolve, such as Ceratopsians, Stegosaurs, and my boy Ankylosaurs, just to name a few. They started small, though, and they were still outclassed by the other non-dino herbivores, like the Dicynodont mammal relatives, who by this time had evolved elephant-sized species such as Lizawickia. The fossilized digestive contents of the giant Lizawickia suggest that it had a more restricted diet, munching mostly on conifer trees, and this became important as the trail of poop and puke continued into stage four. Because during this stage, as the Triassic came to a close around 200 million years ago, the Polish basin, along with the rest of the world, experienced a period of environmental chaos. And for dinosaurs, this chaotic opportunity couldn't have come at a better time. They had now gained a foothold in their environment, but weren't yet super specialized. Massive volcanic eruptions from the central Atlantic magmatic province, combined with tectonic activity in Pangaea, shifting continents around, drove climatic changes that took environments from dry to wet. And the increased humidity, in turn, led to a turnover in plant life, which many of the more specialized herbivores, like the conifer-loving Lizawickia, couldn't adapt to. The coprolites and regurgitolites left by the early dinosaur herbivores, on the other hand, often contain pretty diverse plant species, like ferns, cycads, and ginkgo relatives, including material that had been burned by wildfires. And this ability to eat a variety of vegetation may have helped those dinosaurs adapt to the changing plant life, as other more conifer-reliant non-dino herbivores died out. So body fossils, trackways, and fossilized digestive contents all show that herbivorous dinosaurs completely replaced non-dinosaur herbivores in the basin at this time, while the theropods continued to diversify. Plant-eating sauropodomorphs would eventually give rise to the largest land animals of all time, a journey that began here in stage four, with the first big dinosaur herbivores emerging from the group. Finally, in stage five, the earliest days of the Jurassic, dinosaurs cemented their advantage and established their uncontested rule over life on land. The new abundance of large dinosaur herbivores led to a radiation of ever larger dinosaur carnivores that fed on them. And a new wave of big theropods left behind big fossil coprolites and regurgitolites, complete with the bones of sauropodomorph dinosaurs and early crocodilomorph prey inside. Jurassic food webs on land began filling up with diverse dinosaur species at nearly every higher level as they radiated to take advantage of the opportunity. A mixture of luck and adaptability through a crisis had catapulted dinosaurs to center stage, leaving their competition in the dust. Their reign over planet Earth had begun, and it would last for a very, very long time. Now, fossilized puke and poop still rarely get the appreciation that they deserve. But studies like this are beginning to show just how informative these often overlooked specimens can be, pinpointing, at least in the Polish basin, evidence that environmental changes, biological advantages, and a healthy dose of chance paved the way for the rise of the dinosaurs. And if this approach can be applied elsewhere, then it may be the case that even though we don't have the body fossils we'd like, we've been sitting on a whole crap load of data this entire time. I don't know how else to put it. For more Tales from the Mesozoic, head to the PBS app or pbs.org to watch Walking with Dinosaurs. 25 years after the iconic original series, the new Walking with Dinosaurs reveals how these colossal creatures lived, hunted, and survived through state-of-the-art visual effects based on the latest research. Check out the link in the description to watch this spectacular show. Also, we gotta thank this month's never-overlooked eontologists. Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, Addie, Carl Wolfel, 
Juan M., Jackie Scott Ralston, Andy and Eric Higgins, Raphael Hassa, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, and Steve. By becoming an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like access to exclusive polls and videos from the Eons team. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more meanderings in the Mesozoic. And fossilized intestinal contents? <laughs> Enough data to reconstruct <laughs> Okay, you did a little square dance there in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'm fidgety that way. Mm -hmm. The dysonodont mental relatives. I should get paid by the syllable. Yeet! I'll be in my trailer if you need me. <laughs>